This is the Via de Portico Octavia, which is one of the newest views in the Jewish ghetto. I'm going to show you how you get to Sandra's house from here. Let's go see. One of these streets is so typical of this quarter, which by the way was established, you hear music and restaurants, in the 1500s by order of the Pope, the Jews were ordered to live in one section of the city. At that time, it was the lowest, it flooded frequently from the Tiber. It was one of the least desirable, if not the least desirable section of the city. And there were actually walls and gates and they were compelled to be curfewed at nighttime and in the morning. And then in 1870, the gates were opened with the unification of Italy. And Gentiles moved in, and Jews moved out, probably the noble, into other more desirable sections of the city. But in eternal, Sandra's family remains because his mother works at the nearby hospital. And his father is very nice in the temple of Paris. And they love it here. And this is what I love, where you get to Saint Ambrosia. But what I love about this is that you go through these narrow little passageways, and you come on to the Piazza Matei, which is where Sandra's house is. And you see this beautiful little fountain by Bernini, called the Turtle Fountain. And it's right in front of his house. Thank you so, so much for being here. I appreciate it. I hope you liked the little video. I know the audio sucked on the video. I have to explain. So you saw me walking through the streets of Rome in the Jewish ghetto. Just so you know, let's be clear. That's not being rude. That's not a room term. It's actually called that. I actually think ghetto is Venetian slang, but I'm going to look that up. But I think I remember reading that. So when I was walking through, people live there. Like you're walking right past their houses. So I didn't really think it would be super cool to be walking by and go, yes, in the Jewish ghetto in the 1500s, I didn't want to do that. So I kept my voice really low with the result that you can't hear anything I'm saying, but it works out good because here we are and I can tell you the stuff I said and maybe elaborate a little bit. So let me talk to you. This, I just want to tell you a little about the Jewish ghetto because I'm just going to reveal, oh, look, I'm real, so you know that. I, I grew up, Roman Catholic. We weren't very good Catholics. I remember telling Francesca, my daughter once, we're lapsed Catholics. I told her that when she was little. And she said, we're collapsed Catholics? And I'm like, yeah, that's probably closer to it. So I always, I did not even know, honestly, that you could be Italian and Jewish. Like, I just didn't know any Italian Jews. It turns out that there is a very strong, vibrant Jewish community in Italy. It is a minority, but it is in Rome. And what is the most mind-blowing thing as I started to learn about this, and we'll talk in future videos about how I learned that I want to write this book and what, what really drove me to it. It was back in college from having Philip Roth as a teacher. But what I learned when I started to do my research is that, get ready for this fact, because this is a mind-blowing fact. Well, first of all, you think about Rome, you think of St. Peter's, you think of Christendom, you think it is the seat of Catholicism, and it is, globally. But what is also the seat of is in Rome, the Jewish ghetto, are you ready? Is the oldest continuously existing Jewish community in Western civilization. Do you understand what I'm telling you? And that is because in 2000 years of history, not very great history, the ancient Romans went to, they sacked Jerusalem, they brought Jews back as slaves. They brought them back as slaves and they, kept them in that position. And over time, what happened is, I'm sort of fast forwarding, but in the 1500s, the Pope issued what's called a papal bull, which is kind of an edict. And he said, we are going to make a ghetto in Rome. It is right over the banks of the Tiber. Next week, I'll have a map for you. It's, there's a map in the book. But he said, we are going to make a ghetto and the Jews must live in the ghetto. They must wear yellow badges. We will put, wall, and they put walls around the ghetto. Now, how big is the ghetto? The ghetto was like seven acres. There were thousands of people and it was located in Rome, as I've said, across the river. But sadly, it was probably the least desirable, the least desirable land in all of Rome. Why? Because it was low 
and it was on the banks of the Tiber. So every winter, the Tiber flooded, causing malaria, dreaded diseases, typhus. It was a horrible, horrible place to live. And the Jews were locked inside at night, locked inside. And worse, she can say worse, there was a guard that patrolled to make sure the Jews stayed inside at night, and they had to pay for the guard. So it was really, really bad. But then after Italy unified, um, the walls were taken down and there was a choice. Actually, the Jews, Jews were given a choice. Okay, you don't have to live here anymore. Okay, thanks. Um, do you want to move? And they're like, no, we're going to make our home here. We're, and, and what there was a deal made and what happened was that the ghetto was cleaned out and actually the bank was actually raised so that it wouldn't flood all the time. And there came a synagogue, which I was there and took pictures of a beautiful synagogue was consecrated there. Temp Here's the temple right at the entrance to the synagogue. And all the entrances of the synagogue, weirdly in those horrible old times, there were churches put there and Jews were forced to attend the church and they were trying to force them to convert. But um, here is the synagogue and it became the center of this really thriving, wonderful Jewish community. The streets were still kind of small and a little bit dark. But the, the community life centered on these beautiful uh, little largos that enter the, as you enter, and you'll see all of this on the website and in future videos. Here's what's called the Portico di Ottavia, which is the, this portico. Oh, let me get it on. I took this picture too. So you can see that's where everybody met. There was a street, Via Catalana, lots of beautiful, just it's small, but it's a really tight, cohesive neighborhood. And you'll see it really come to life, I hope. In, in eternal, because I really think it does. And also, you know, when you go to Rome, and I put this, you know, I always, as we're talking about historical fiction, you learn things, and, but you still can't, even though you have all this really important world history, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, it can't, it has to serve a story, even though if it's really important true life history. And, but you're always telling what you see through the eyes of a character. So for example, if you've been to Rome, I didn't take this picture, but this was at the Roman Forum. This is called the Arch of Titus. And I'd seen this before in previous trips to Rome. I go, well, that's so beautiful. Look how beautiful that is. And when I was there in Rome, when I took these videos, I hired a guy who was a historian, a member of the community. He walked me around. We talked all about that. So that's how I got part of the way I got all the facts I put in the book in addition to my own research. And I said, well, well tell me about the Arch of Titus because it's so, you know, I know it has to do with bringing the Jews back. He's, well, you think that's a beautiful arch, but to us, or to me rather, he said, that looks like a yoke because we were brought as slaves. And that is the yoke around the neck of a human being. And I thought, oh, that's really important. That's an important perspective. And it has to be in this book. Now, I won't tell you um, what actually happens in the book, but I will tell you that when I learned about this world event, it really was the motivating thing for me to write this. I was like, this is a story that really needs to be told. Because people are walking by the Jewish quarter or the ghetto. And I, I, I went there again when I was, I'm lucky enough to be published in Italy. And it was about 10 years ago. And my Italian publisher said, oh, let's, I'll take you to a great restaurant. We'll have fried artichokes. And I love artichokes. So what, because you dip in butter. I'm like, okay, anything dipped in butter, I'm going to like. And we go there. And I realized uh, this is this Jewish ghetto. And we ha I will tell you that the artichokes are incredible. I put them in the book too. There's a lot of great fried foods that are Jewish delicacies of the time that are in this book. The Olive Escalani, which is fried olives from Ascoli Piceno, which is where my family's from. So it was really, really, I wanted to get that that sense memory of the food, because we know that food is about family and tradition and culture and religion. And the interesting thing, particularly in this book I pointed out, is that the Italian Jews viewed themselves as Italian and Jewish both. They, and in fact, when fascism came on, they joined the fascist party in equal numbers, equal percentage numbers, not equal numbers, an equal pr proportion of the population as Gentiles. They never realized that fascism might turn against them because they were Italian. And so all of those undercurrents, together with the, with the idea that St. Peter's is 10 minutes away and there is the Jewish ghetto, is all at work in this book. Because when I really started to do the research, I understood that the Jewish ghetto is not about the archers, however wonderful they are. It's really hallowed ground. And when you read Eternal, you'll see why. But that stuff of the culture, that stuff of Italian Jewish culture, I really wanted this novel drenched with.